welcome to the 399th episode of the cross-border interviews with Christopher Brown. I am your host, Christopher Brown. Um, before we get into today's episode, I want to say that we are going to be taking a, uh, July and August off. And as a special treat, we always try to bring in a guest for our last episode for before our hiatus who encapsulates what our show is about, about talking to people from across the political spectrum, across the borders, and just having a discussion. And I am so honored to have our guest in today. She is uh, currently, if I'm not mistaken, we, I didn't ask this question, but she's currently in Nova Scotia. I'm gonna read her resume off here for a little bit. So please bear with me because it is quite long. <laughs> But she is the former member of parliament for Cumberland Colchester from 2019 to 2021 as a Liberal Party of Canada MP. She was the former member of the Legislative Assembly in Nova Scotia from 20, 2009 to 2019 for the riding of, and I want to make sure I read this correctly, Turo, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. But that did change, uh, I think, in the third election. Miss Lenore Zan. Lenore, thank you so much for doing this. This is an honor and a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much. And, you know, uh, we could also add that those 10 years with the provincial uh, legislature of Nova Scotia, I was with the NDP. And yes. Then, and then federally, <laughs> I switched and I was with uh, Mr. Trudeau and the federal liberals. And you, while I would know that part of the story, the most most people tuning into this might know her from her other career as well. And you might know her from her most famous role that people would probably know her for is from the 1990s Fox Kids TV show X-Men as Rogue, the mutant on uh, Professor X's team. Lenore, uh, again, thank you so much for doing this. I'm looking forward to this next 45 minutes. Oh, well, you're so, you're so, uh, I, I am honored to be here and uh, sugar, it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> so Lenore, I have started every single one of my interviews with politicians, former politicians, candidates to be politicians, the exact same way and you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? You know, um, I always felt that we need to give back to society. Um, and to give back to our communities. And my, my family instilled that in me. My parents are both teachers. My sister is a teacher. And so I grew up knowing that the way kids are brought up and the way that they're taught by adults and other community members really can make a big difference in their lives for the rest of their life. And so um, as an actor, I felt it was important to be out there uh, entertaining people, making people feel and think and um, ponder important subjects, but also to feel their feelings. And then when I decided I wanted to go into politics, it was because I really wanted to be able to make a difference, especially when it comes to children and the future and also the planet, you know, the, 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 the climate, climate change and all of these important issues. And so I felt that if I ran and I won, that would be a great way of doing service and, and being able to also stay in my hometown instead of having to travel all around out of a suitcase, which I had done for 30 years as an actor. <laughs> I, so I, I, the the the, big, the open ended question that I have to ask, and the million dollar question is, how does a voice actress slash actress become a politician? Because I'm assuming uh, we 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 saw what happened down the stage with Donald Trump, a overzealous, and I'm not comparing you to Donald Trump at all here, but I'm saying. How does a, a, a woman who was born in Australia move to Regina, then to Turo, Nova Scotia, become a voice actress and then become a politician? It seems like a very long trip that you made to get to helping back and giving back to that duty to serve that you just talked about. A long and winding road. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, well, let's put it this way. I mean, before I became a voice actor, I, I became an actor. So I started acting at the age of 15 in you know, high school musicals. And then I got into a community theater, amateur theater in Nova Scotia. And then I did an audition for the Neptune Theater when I was 16, which is the professional theater of our province. And I was scooped up 
at that first audition that I did and they hired me. Then I went on to the Charlottetown Festival in Prince Edward Island. And I did summer, summer jobs as an actor at professional theater companies. Then I went to York University in Toronto and studied drama and oh, political science. I, I'm not going to hold that against you as a Queen's University man. I'm not going to hold the fact that you, you went you to go. York University. Anyway, well, continue. Sorry. They have a good drama program. They, they <laughs> certainly <laughs> do. You know, so yeah, so I went there and studied drama and political science, which were my two loves. And then I started booking jobs and I was found, discovered to play Marilyn Monroe in a rock opera on the life of Marilyn Monroe out in Edmonton at the Citadel Theater when I was only 19. And that put me on the map. And then I was getting movies, television. I was being flown all around the world, right across North America, back and forth. And I didn't uh, do voice work until I was uh, 31. Um, and it was a really a, a fluke in a sense. My agent in Toronto said, hey, there's this new animation series. They're looking for someone, a, a woman with a, a, a husky, low, sexy voice who can do like um, a Southern accent. And Lenore, that's you. Cause I had played a lot of those roles on television and film already. And when I went in and I went into the booth and put the headphones on and I did the lines that were laid out for me, which were, um, you know, my daddy liked to kill himself when he found out I was a mutant. <laughs> I remember when I was 13, I had me a boyfriend, had me a boyfriend till I kissed him. Poor boy went into a coma for three days. So, you know, I did that. And then I heard these producers in Los Angeles screaming on the other end of the headphones going, that's her, that's rogue. Don't let her leave. And then the rest is history. So, so I'm assuming was, those producers were Eric and Julie? They were not. They were actually Larry Houston. Okay. Uh, and a bunch of other guys from Saban and Fox. Uh, for yeah. anyone who's listened to the show, uh, we had Julie and uh, Eric on the show way back when in their first, I think our second season. And he told me a story and I'm going to jump back here a little bit, but I want to get your record on this. Mm -hmm. You didn't actually meet them in person until... Eric wrote the book almost, correct? Yeah, a couple of years ago. Wow. That, that, like I didn't you, meet any of them, none of us did, because they were in Los Angeles and we were all in Toronto. And for anybody who doesn't know, I mean, this is something I think Canadians should be proud of. Every single one of the original X Men animated series are Canadian actors from across Canada. And we smoked it, you know? They tried out Americans, they tried out other people from other countries, and then they came to Canada and they wanted actors who were, had really good acting chops, actors who had done theater, actors who were in movies and television, not just voiceover actors who can do funny little voices, but actual actors who can really get deep into the material. And so that's how we all got cast. And so, you, you go, that was in the early 90s. Um, I also wrote a play, which I took to Broadway or off Broadway, which I did in the early 2000s. And that was about Marilyn Monroe as well. You know, and I did Law and Order, a lot of these different shows. And then once I had done that, I, I the play that I wrote about Marilyn, Marilyn Monroe was, was kind of political too, because it was about women in the 1950s, women and how they were treated, women and how that people like to put them in little boxes and say, oh, she's like this, or she's just silly or goofy or whatever. Like you can't be smart and good looking. You can only be one or the other. And, um, and how women are, 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 are forced to have to try and look like models and Barbie dolls. And, and also just about how the fact that Marilyn Monroe was a really smart woman and she was stuck in this dumb blonde persona. And so my, my play was pretty political. And once I started hearing the audience loving all the political Aww. stuff and the feminist stuff, I realized I was kind of tired of just saying other people's lines and playing roles. I really wanted to, to get more into giving speeches about all the things I believed in. So when I moved home to Truro, Nova Scotia in 2007, and I was asked to run for politics by the NDP, um, I thought, well, here's an opportunity. Here's an opportunity to speak from the heart, to be myself. I don't have to be another character. 
and uh, I can try and make a difference. And that is indeed what, what happened. So I want to jump back to your time at 19, because you say you were here in this uh, in Edmonton, you uh, were playing Marilyn Monroe, uh, the Citadel Theater. And then it, your career blew up at that time. It like overnight, you kind of became this sort of new star in the Canadian theater and uh, yeah. te uh, television. Uh, were you prepared for that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> were you? Because you, yeah. you, you seem like a down home type of person who seems very relaxed and in your own, like you feel comfortable in your own skin. Like when I get noticed by people are like, hey, you do that show. I'm like, well, okay, that's that's great. And then I feel awkward. Like for you, it just seems like you're so natural. And you're like, I, I'm happy that I do it. Well, it it came to me naturally acting and singing. Like I, I hadn't really taken any actual lessons till I went to York University. But the thing is, I'd already been performing. I started performing when I was 15 and I played in leading roles. So by the time I got to university, I actually was already professional. I had my professional actor's card. And I loved to get out there and perform and to deal you know, with the energy of the audience and make them laugh and make them cry and be with them. And, and it's almost like an exchange of energy with an audience, with a live audience. And I, I really love that. And if you talk to any theatrical actors, they'll say the same thing. So for me, it was, it just felt like, it just felt natural. And um, to be honest, when I was 16 and I was just starting out, I was like, well, how long is it going to take them before they they realize, you know, that I've really got something here. So, you know, I was I was one of those a little bit precocious, but you you wouldn't know it, except that once I got up on stage, I was like a monster. I would eat the scenery, you know. We, we, we always talk about the good in our life, and this is what, where the show comes in. We, we want to just not talk about the good, but we want to talk about the bad sometimes as well. Was there ever a moment during your career when, especially those formative years after 19, when you started getting founded and, and you went, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe it is struggling because we always, we always want to hear about the good things because then we give hope to the next generation. But there is always the underbelly side of the story, which is the, okay, there was times when I was struggling and I couldn't get the uh, jobs and I'd go apply for, or go, uh, go audition for roles and I wasn't getting them. Was there moments in your time when that was happening to you as well? Well, sure. I mean, to be an actor means that you have to get used to a lot of rejection. For every job that you get, you get turned down at least probably 20 times. Wow. Um, and so you have to learn to be able to appreciate yourself from within and to have a firm center that isn't going to be blown off course by someone saying, oh, you're the best thing since sliced bread or, oh, you are the worst thing and you deserve to be not on the stage and you should just go home and be ashamed. You can't listen to either one. You have to just go, this is what I do. I want to do this for a living. I know that I'm good at what I do. And, and, and beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Everybody, I, I, for instance, when I was 22 years old, I went out for an audition in the morning for a job and I went out for another audition in the afternoon. Both, uh, one was a theater one and one was a television one. The one in the morning, they said, you know, Lenore, you're fantastic. I love your acting, but I look at you and boy, you know, to me, you seem like you're 12 years old. You don't seem like you've been around the block or you would you know, necessarily understand this character who was 22 years old, which is what the age I was. And I was like, really? And I'm like, oh, wow, okay. And then in the afternoon, I went to another one and they said, look, you know, Lenore, we, we love your acting, but we look at you and boy, you, you really look like too old for 22. You, you look too worldly wise and like you've been beaten up around the block. I'm like, Jesus, I'm the same age. I'm wearing the same clothes. I mean, one person says this, another, that was a really good lesson for me. I, you know, I, I, I guess it does spill over a little bit to politics too then because you you can't please everyone in politics so you, you kind yeah. of were kind of a natural fit for politics in some sense because no matter what you do you're going to get yelled at by both sides right exactly you can never make everybody happy it's true 
And yes, and to be an actor, we go through different stages of our life where we change our age and we're not able to play the same roles we were playing before. Some people that kills them. They're like, oh, but but I'm but I'm the girl next door. I'm the you know, and well, you don't look, you know, sweetheart, sorry, but you're older now. You're not the girl next door anymore or the boy next door or whatever. Um, so one thing I did make sure that I did constantly was I did shift and change my image. And when I would get tired of being only cast in a certain way and felt like, look, this is just not me anymore and I don't want to do it, I would change the way I looked. Like for instance, I, and I moved, I moved from Toronto to Vancouver at one point when I was in my thirties because I didn't want to be seen as like the femme fatales or the girl on the bar stool in the bar or this or that. I wanted to be playing lawyers and police officers and inspectors and things like that. So I cut my hair very, very short. I started wearing black suits and, and white shirts. And I would even go to auditions for characters that were like hookers wearing that. So I didn't look at all like the character they wanted me to audition for. But it, after a while, they got the idea and they were like, oh yeah, like Lenore, that's not good for Lenore. Oh, Lenore, oh, Lenore would be better for this role. And then, and then I started booking the roles that I wanted to book. So you have to almost be a step ahead of them all the time. I, I, I want to talk about the difference between Toronto and Vancouver here because uh, I, I, I'm an outsider's perspective on this, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but in Toronto, it's more of a Canadian film industry, and in Vancouver, it's more of a, an American film industry because you see more of the uh, American TV shows coming up to Vancouver and filming there because they have a bit of the, a unique look that looks more American than Toronto. Is that true? That is somewhat true. Also, the thing about LA and Vancouver is they're on the same time zone. Okay. They're on the same time zone and they're close. So it's easy, easy for Americans from California to come into Vancouver and go back and forth. So that's another part of that reason why it is a bit of a cottage industry that way. Okay. And yeah, a lot of American shows do come and shoot there. And I did do a lot of American shows there and I, I enjoyed it. Um, but independent films, Canadian independent films are being done right across the country. And I'll, I'll put in a plug here for tax credits. The provinces that have the best tax credits and the best to offer filming and, and the screen industry, they're the ones that are going to get the work. And that's really good for the provinces. That's good because, you know, they come in with their trucks and they need hotels and they need food and they need catering and they need seamstresses and they need carpenters and they need all of this stuff. It's so good for the economy. And, you know, I always say that the, the screen industry is, you know, we are, we are shovel ready too. <laughs> we are shovel ready and we are a green industry. Uh, you know, we don't pollute and, and we can sell the area to the world and say, look at this beautiful area, come and visit this beautiful area. Like, you know, it, there's so many good reasons to have film and television shooting in your communities. And, and I think that governments need to be constantly reminded of that. I, I think you just won my husband over because he was very much instrumental of trying to expand the uh, film industry and television industry here in Alberta during his time as Minister of Culture and Tourism. So he he probably is listening to this as it airs and goes, yep, I agree with her wholeheartedly. There you go. Well, that's, that's excellent. Well, maybe he needs to run again and get back in again. There you go. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll keep on pushing him. Um, yeah, I want to I want to turn to your time in politics because I, I want to make sure I get that because that's that's where I'm going to geek out a little bit here I, and then afterwards we'll talk actually before we do that we got to talk about the big thing because we'll try and do this in chronological order sure. X-Men 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 um, voice acting work as Rogue did you think it was a as big of a thing while doing it that it has turned into like when you were there reading your lines doing it with the uh i'm assuming you were with you weren't just by yourself from time to time you had other actors there as well but yeah. when you guys were doing it did you guys think this is going to be bigger than what we expect or was it no. one of these okay it's just a job we'll come in we'll read our lines and we'll go home yeah like well we all loved it like we all i think um recognized that the scripts were incredible 
and we loved our characters and we loved each other and we would come in it would we would do like a radio drama reading where we were all in the same studio in the same room in the beginning <clears throat> so we would get to see each other and get to play off each other and and it was so much fun but no we had no idea how big it was going to be and in fact we did not know until a couple of years ago when we went start when we were invited to our first comic con where we met Eric and Julia, the two writers, and Larry Houston, the art director. And we had no idea. They told us that Fox, when we did the show, when the show first came on air 30 years ago, 30 years ago this, this year, when the show came on, there was so much fan mail from around the world to Fox Network that it they filled up bins that went down one hallway and across another and down another and filled them right to the ceiling with letters and mail from fans from around the world. But guess what? We never saw them. Wow. We, the actors, never got them. We had no idea. Nobody told us. And nobody ever replied to all those fans, those young people, which just kills us today. We're like, well, for one thing, it would have been nice to know. And on another thing, it would have been really nice to write back to the fans, which, but we, we, we were kept in the dark. We had no idea. So we, we only really found out a couple of years ago how big the show has been and is and how much of a difference it's made in so many people's lives. And so now that uh, Disney and Marvel have announced the reboot of the series that we did 30 years ago, um, it now makes sense because now we've met the fans, you know, going to the Comic-Con in Los Angeles a few years ago, for instance, there were a hundred thousand fans there wow. screaming for the show. They, they loved the show and they loved our characters. So we're going to give it to them. I'm going to play this uh, sandbox for a bit, if you don't mind. Sure. It's always hard to go back to something that is so, such a cultural impact on so many people for the reboot that Disney Plus is putting together. And I think it comes out, if I'm not mistaken, early next year or sometime in 2023. Correct me if I'm wrong, because you're the <laughs> one doing part of it. So I'm assuming you know when it's coming out. Um, was it an easy yes to say, sure, I'll do it. Let's let's get back into the studio. Let's start recording the uh, Rogues line again. Or was it was there a little bit of an apprehensiveness to you to say, I don't want to go back into the studio and then create a product that might let fans down who are who have held this show in such high esteem for so long, 30 years later to go, sorry guys. Like, was there any apprehensive or was it a quick yes, let's do it because the whole, the old team was getting back together, the ones that are still around. Well, interestingly enough, this is where politics and the arts again <laughs> pass. Um, after 12 years of being an elected official four times in a row, um, I lost the last election. So the very last election in last year was a quick election, as you know, and it was a it was it, it was an early election. I'd only been federal. I'd only been in for about two years, yep. less 19 months. And most of that was under the, um, COVID. The, the COVID. So we got sent back home from Ottawa two months after I'd been there and I was stuck in my house the whole time. Um, so interestingly enough, I sadly lost the election and I was really depressed because I was like, wow, you know, I worked so hard for 12 years and, you know, what do I do now? You know, I'm 12 years older now. I, I, I gave up my acting career to do this and now I'm 12 years older and we know how hard the, the, the business is on women. Mm -hmm. And then it was weird because I got this email from a, a producer here in Nova Scotia who had produced Trailer Park Boys. He was one of the producers of that. And he said, hey, Lenore, I'm so sorry you lost the election. You were our champion of the arts and the environment and everything. He said, man, we're, we're really gonna miss you. But does this mean you could now be in my new feature film? <laughs> right? <laughs> and I was like, oh, what feature film is that? So then he goes, uh, it's called The Madones. It's about three sisters named Madone who had a band one time, the band broke up and now you find out now why the band broke up. It's a pretty amazing story. And he wanted me to play like one of the three sisters. 
So I was like, yeah, why not? <laughs> right? I'm, I think, let me look. Oh yeah, my calendar's free. The calendar <laughs> unexpectedly just freed up for the next few years. <laughs> so whenever you're ready. <laughs> right. So I said, sure, I, I'd love to do it. So that, that was that. Next thing I know, I get another email from someone in the States going, hey, Lenore, listen, um, would you be at all interested in like rebooting the X-Men and taking on your role of Rogue again? Because Disney is thinking about doing it and they want to know if you would like, if you would be interested. And I was like, well, first of all, is this a prank call? You know, like, uh, if, if this is serious, ask the casting person to contact me. And then the casting director contacted me and we talked for about an hour on the phone and we got along wonderfully and it was legitimate and it was real. And she said, yeah, they, they'd like you to come back and we're going to, we're, we're going to reboot the series. So I did an audition for them. I had to do an audition over zoom to make sure that they knew my voice was still the same and everything. And then they were like, yeah, we want you. Would you come on board with Disney and Marvel? <laughs> I was like, uh, well, yeah, I think I can. <laughs> I, 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 I could move that vacant spot between 2021 and 2023 around. So sure. Yeah, like, okay, I think I can handle that. So that's how, I mean, like, can you imagine? Can you imagine, you know, an actor to a politician, you lose the election and then bang, Disney's calling and bang, a movie. I'm. I'm still going, thank you, universe, whatever's going on. They always I'm say doing. that everything happens for a reason, right? Exactly. So, exactly. Um, so. I, I, I am so, uh, I, I'm, I'm excited to talk about the next part here. And that is your time in politics. Um, you, you move back to, from, if I'm not mistaken, Toronto or Vancouver to your hometown of Truro. Yeah. And the NDP comes calling. Mm -hmm. um, was that the natural fit for you at that time to say, if the NDP is calling, I'll pick up the call? Or were, were you even thinking about running for politics at that time? Or was it, was it until they called or a political party called that you said, yeah, I'll do it. Sure. Why not? Well, interestingly enough, I hadn't been thinking about it when I moved here. I, what I was thinking at the time was there's an airport 45 minutes from my house my parents are in the same little town. My sister's in the same little town. So I'm close to my family. There's an airport 45 minutes away. I can jump on flights and go and do my acting jobs and come home. Yeah. Um, but if we go back to when I was about 24 years old and doing theater at the Neptune Theater in Halifax, uh, John Neville was the artistic director of the theater then. And he was good friends with Alexa McDonough who was the leader of the NDP in Nova Scotia at the time. In fact, she was the only woman and the only NDP in the house at, of the legislature. And then later on, she ran for leader of the federal party and won. And she was also good friends with my family because my mom and dad were lifelong NDPers. Like when we moved to Regina from Australia, they, they loved uh, Prime Minister the elder Trudeau, but once they found out about the NDP and Tommy Douglas and all that, they they became NDPers. And so Alexa came to see me in a play at the Neptune and asked to meet me afterwards. And she and I and John Neville all went out for dinner. And then she said, you know, Lenore, if you'd be great as a in the legislature, you'd be a great politician. And I said, well, you know, I just don't think people would take me seriously yet. You know, I was 24 and I just I just didn't think I had the gravitas. And she said, well, come and job shadow me on um, International Women's Day and see what I have to deal with. So on International Women's Day, when I was 24, I went to the legislature and I watched from the gallery. And there she was, the only woman and the only NDP in the legislature. And she was giving these impassioned speeches about women and about all things that I care about, the environment, all these different things. And the men were there and they were throwing paper airplanes at each other. That's what all the men were doing. And I remember looking at her and going, oh my God, like someday when I'm older, yes, I could be down there and I would could be doing this, but you know, not yet. And that stayed with me. So when I was asked to run by the NDP, you know, 
fast forward to when I'm, I was 49, I had, when I moved back home, I called Alexa and we went out. I said, what do you think? They want me to run here in Truro. And she's, I said, you know, everybody says I'm crazy. There's no way I would ever win. It's a conservative writing, which it had been for like 150 years. And she said, you know what, Lenore, I'm getting ready to leave politics. I think it's your time. She said, I think you should do it. And so I did and I won in a landslide. And then I continued to win three more times. Well, technically four more times. <laughs> because you uh, won the first time, second time, third time, and then you won the federal time. one. Yeah, sure. um, I, but before we you glossed over a bit of a big issue because not only are you running in a very strong conservative area, mm -hmm. you're running against the Minister of Finance as well, who had just been named the Minister of Finance in that first election that you won in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the writing was Turo Bible Hill at the time. So yeah. because he had just, because the finance minister of Nova Scotia had passed away, they appointed this new minister. And so you're running against a finance minister, but you easily beat him and become the new MLA for Turo Bible Hill. That moment, yeah, that moment, that night, do you remember it? Do you remember I do. that? I do, remember do you, it very well. Do you remember that? Was there a check mark beside your name that it sunk in? You went, oh God, what have I done? Or was there a check mark that said, holy, I now have responsibility, not just to myself, but to right. the people who have just elected. Let's put it this way. I was in my bathroom at this house, putting on makeup to go to the event to find out whether I won or lost, you know, like, the, you know, they, they hold the thing and you watch it on television and they come, all the results come in and all that. So I was, I was getting ready to go to that. And my cell phone rang and it was my sister and she was um, in Salmon River, I believe it was counting ballots at one of the, you know, one of the ballot stations, the, and she said, Lenore, oh my God, she said, you just won every poll in Salmon River. And I said, Hockeyville? Because <laughs> that's what it was known as, Hockeyville. It had won Hockeyville. I said, Hockeyville? I, I won in Hockeyville? She said, you won every poll. And I was like, oh my gosh, I better think about a speech. <laughs> and that was when it started to dawn on me that if I could win in Salmon River, which was known as Hockeyville, which I, I didn't feel they knew me as well as say Truro where I'd done plays and I'd done, you know, all this stuff. And sure enough, I mean, it won, I won in a landslide. So it was, it was a big moment. And yes, I realized then there would be, a, it, it was a lot of responsibility, but I was ready for it. I was because ready to give my life to it. This is the same election that the NDP wins government as well. Yes. So this That's is, right. the, and this is, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the first time the NDP had formed government in Nova Scotia. Ever. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so, Daryl Dexter became the premier. Um, what was so your relationship he, with Daryl? Good. It was good. Was it? Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to talk about one moment because this I, I love this question and I'm going to ask it about federal politics as well, but I'm going to start with uh, uh, provincial. Walking into the legislature as a sitting MLA for the very first time, there's a weight on your shoulders. You may not know that there's a weight on your shoulders, but there's a weight on your shoulders that you are now in that room to make decisions that are going to affect the everyday lives of everyone in your province and nationally, nationally. For you, what was it like to walk into that building for the first time as a sitting, as an elected official in the province of Nova Scotia? It felt like being part of history because that building is so old. It's, you know, the very first legislature in Canada and the weight of history is on you. You know, you see Joseph Howe, you know, there's a statue of Joseph Howe there. You know, and, and I love what Joseph Howe said, which is, you know, as I sit in my study and ponder, I always think, you know, what is right? What is just? What is for the public good? And that was my motto. And so you have all those kinds of people looking out at you from the paintings and things that are on the walls. And yeah, it's, it's a very, very sombering 
but a very on you feel honor and you feel humble. Um, the other thing that had happened, which was interesting too, was that the uh, the gentleman who was the head of the opposition had to apologize to me on the floor of the house because um, when we had been when it was announced that I was going to be running, uh, the one of the opposition parties sent a picture of me from the L word. Like I had been, I'd shot the L word in Vancouver, just one episode, and there was a shower scene in it. And so some bright eyed idiot uh, decided to send a picture of me topless in this, from the shower scene to the CBC six o'clock news the day that it was announced I was running for the NDP <laughs> as, a, as a way to try and like, I guess, chop me off at the knees or whatever so that I couldn't run. And all these cameras descended upon Little Truro and Bible Hill, chasing after every little old lady they could find to say, what do you think? What do you think about this woman? You know, she's got this, she did this show. And, and to a T, all of them said, what are you talking about? This is the 21st century. She's an actress. Get over it. That's her job, right? <laughs> and, you know, so like I said, I won in a landslide. And then within 24 hours, the leader of the opposition had to apologize. And I said, well, you can apologize to me when I'm on the on the floor of the house. And he did. He, he had to. Because <laughs> he agreed. Wow. I, I, <laughs> okay. God bless politics sometimes. Um, <laughs> I'm going to ask a touchy subject and I'm okay. going to, I'm going to go into a little bit deep here because I, I want to, because I have seen the vitriol attacks that women get in politics federally. Mm -hmm. I have seen the vitriol attacks that women get in politics here in Alberta, and they are the worst things that I've ever seen. I just, I, I tell people I'll shake their heads and get off social media from time to time because yeah. negativity doesn't work. Did you receive any, misogyny during your time in uh, Nova Scotia politics where and yet again that comment about the L word and having a picture of you topless comes out but after that did were people nice or was there attacks because oh you're a woman you're not going to do well in politics was there any of that in your time in your 10 years in Nova Scotia politics um yes uh there was it went in waves during those 10 years. Um, so and fix that? I, I, well, I did have to also deal with sometimes men in higher positions like, uh, like deputy ministers and things uh, looking it, like if I would go in and I want to talk about um, an issue and if there was a man with me, they would always talk to the man, not to me. Oh, wow. And I'm the one that's the elected official and I'm the one bringing the issue up. Things like that would happen a lot. But also, yes, the vitriol on social media was pretty bad. I had to leave Twitter at one point because it was so awful. And I left Twitter for about a year. Um, but it got really bad when I was running federally. When I went federal, we had... Um, this terrible mass shooting here in my writing, the largest mass shooting in Canada's history. And um, being the, the member of parliament for the area, I was on television a lot and, and really tried to hold a space of grace for my community, for the families, for the, all of us who were grieving and in shock and mourning. And really we were all in PTSD, I believe, all of us. It was, it was so shocking. But, you know, two weeks after the shooting, our government announced that we were going to go ahead with what we had said we were going to do during the election, which was to ban 1500 types of semi-automatic weapons, including rocket grenade launchers. I mean, as if people need rocket grenade launchers in their backyard. I mean, yeah. come on. And so I was asked on a show uh, something like, well, do you think it's too soon to talk about gun control. And I said, no, it's never too soon to talk about better gun control. And, you know, this man had amassed a whole stash of illegal weapons uh, of both semi-automatics and handguns. And he, you know, and people are getting them from across the border. Whatever we can do to try and make things safer for Canadians, we have to do. Well, I started getting bombarded and attacked 
by people that were members of the Rifle Association of Canada. That's kind of the sister group with the NRA. Yeah. And so I started getting death threats. Uh, I started getting like neo-Nazi propaganda shoved in my door of my office. Um, it got so bad that my staff was afraid to go to work. My one of my staff had a had a she had a stroke. Um, I had to get security around my house uh, because of it, and uh, and it, and it just it proceeded to get worse and worse and worse. And the the vitriol and the misogyny and the disgusting things that people were saying about me on social media it just ramped up and it was out of hand it was it really gave me ptsd my whole staff and i were were suffering and um so by the time and and you know as you know my niece my lovely little niece also had cancer and we found out she was dying and we only had a few months left with her and that was going on at the same time so i was grieving my niece I was being attacked constantly by these terrible, terrible misogynistic and vitriol on social media. And plus afraid for my life in real life or in my own house, that it was, it was really something I would never wish it on my worst enemy. And I don't think anybody should have to go through. So in some ways losing the election, it all stopped. It stopped then. So it shows me, yeah, it was all political. It was political and it shouldn't have to be that way. How do we stop that? How do, how do we become a more united country? Because I have seen the rise of hate. And yet again, I'm a, a gay white male who can pass as straight. So, I, and I'm a bigger guy. So people aren't attacking me left, right and center. Uh, but my husband, I saw the attacks that he got as a gay Jewish immigrant from uh, Nicaragua. So I saw what he saw on a regular basis. I've seen what you I, you received. I probably haven't seen what exactly what you saw, but I've seen women get attacked over and over again. Politics has become so divided in today's society. How do we get back to a more like? And I, I think, yeah. Well, I do have to say. I call it the Trump factor. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, when Donald Trump started campaigning, he started attacking immigrants. He started attacking LGBTQ2 plus people, trans people, um, women. Uh, and he made it so that it was almost seemed okay for people to be as rambunctiously uh, sexist and racist and nasty and, and homophobic as, as they want it to be. And that's not okay. So I think, and, and so then you they, they, they try and go further and say, well, all these woke people have destroyed the way we you can't even make jokes anymore because all these woke people or whatever, the cancel culture. So the thing is, I think we have to go back to being able to look in each other's eyes and say, look, we are human beings. We are all here for a very short amount of time. Surely to God, loving one another and helping one another and helping to create a healthy and happy environment for our children, our grandchildren, and for us as we get older, isn't that something that we can all get on and, and agree? upon. And, and I think we have to keep that message going. And that's why I love the X-Men. I love the X-Men because my character and the X-Men are all about uniting people and saying, it's okay to be different. Yeah. You know, we're, we're all mutants. Wow. Isn't that cool? You know, I, 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 I always say to everyone who I've ever had this on, on the show, I've said this numerous times over the last 399 episodes, is I believe it started with the rise of social media. The rise of social media stopped people from having these face-to-face -face conversations. And this is where the show came from was I wanted to get back to those face-to-face -face conversations because if you're willing to yell at me on social media, I guarantee you're not willing to yell at me in my face. There are some people who will, but 
I'm willing to have anyone on for a civil lines conversation about anything. And I just, I wish we would get back to that part. And I, yes. I agree that Donald Trump lit the match and social media just blew it up. So I, I hope people get back to that. But we're not here to talk about bad things. We're here to talk about good times. And that is politics. And the, the end this off, I want to talk about your decision to, because I, I'm going to try and do this as quickly as possible and try to correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, 2009 to 2000, uh, you get reelected uh, after your first term, you get reelected in after your second term, and then you decide to run for the leadership of the NDP, correct? Mm. Yeah. So you run against the Gary Burrell, who is the current leader. He's stepping down as of, I think, June, if I'm not mistaken, because the new leader mm -hmm. is going to be acclaimed as the Nova Scotia NDP. Um, yeah. Why did you decide to run for the leadership? Was it just your time? Did you think it was it was the right thing to do at that time? Or did you have someone telling you maybe you should because I think you'd be a good leader? Um, well, again, Alexa McDonough was on my team, <laughs> you know, and Alexa said, yeah, go for it. We need a woman. We need someone with chutzpah. And she believed in me, <laughs> you know? And so I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Um, the other thing was that, you know, when the NDP won that first time, we were only in for one term. Yeah. So then then the government fell and I was one of only seven people who kept our seats. And of those seven, I was the only one who hadn't been a cabinet minister. So I was a backbencher, the only backbencher. Yeah. And and we had no leader like the the, the, the premier lost his seat. So that meant immediately we had to have an elect, we had to have a, a leadership race. It was decided within the party that they wanted to wait a couple of years. And so we made, uh, had an interim leader uh, and then, and I announced that I was going to run for leader. And so did Dave Wilson, who was also one of the MLAs in the, the group, that group of seven. Gary Burrell had lost his seat, so he yeah. wasn't there. And so then it was the three of us said that we were going to run. I was the only woman. And to be honest, it showed me the nasty side also of partisan politics where, you know, power, when people taste power and they want to get power, they can become pretty nasty. And, and the, the whisper campaigns and the things that happen behind the scenes against people in the same party is pretty disgusting as well. And it, it, it very much, um, I was really saddened to see a lot of what happened, especially since the establishment per se had decided they wanted Dave Wilson to be the leader. And um, they didn't want me or Gary, but then they went after Gary's for the second for the second ballot and they yeah. got him. So he was able to win on the second ballot and I came second and the person that they wanted was last. Yeah. So so I ran and I lost. Would and you have done it again? Knowing what you know now, would you would would you still do it? Would still have yeah. Done only I, I would know what they were gonna do now. <laughs> I have a bright idea how to counter it. <laughs> I didn't know that at the time. Now I know, but but I wouldn't run now. I mean, you know, there is a leadership race on. There has been a leadership race, and nobody put their name in except for one person. And I, I wouldn't go back now. You know. Um, your last term in the Nova Scotia legislature is kind of a turbulent one because you you get elected as the NDP, Nova Scotia NDP, and then uh, Bill Casey in your home riding of Cumberland, Colchester, former progressive conservative turned independent, told, turned conservative, if I'm not mistaken, turned liberal, very confusing with him, but you probably yeah. know him better than I do. Yes. Um, he announces he's not seeking re-election. Right. Do you do you have aspirations to go federal or are you comfortable doing just uh, pro provincial issues at this time? And then how does the jump happen? OK, so I'd been a provincial legislator for 10 years. Yeah, I had had 11 different critic portfolios at that point. Pretty significant ones. Education, agriculture, tourism, like Perfect. you had some pretty film, yeah. post-secondary education. Um, yeah, 
all, tons, tons and tons and tons of things. And I learned so much. It was fabulous. Um, but I, I wasn't happy in the caucus. Once Gary became leader, he seemed to push me to the side and not want me to have any kind of um, attention, that sort of thing. Like maybe just he wanted to be the star of the show and put her over to the side. She might take up too much light or something, you know. So it, it was it was very unpleasant. Um, and to be honest, the the other women that were in the caucus were not particularly friendly to me because they had been Gary Burrell supporters. And so, yeah, so it was a it was a difficult time. Um, and I did start thinking about running federally. Um, I had been talking to the NDP about it, the federal NDP, but Bill Casey uh, cornered me one day on Remembrance Day, actually. We were at a dinner and he said, hey, Lenore, listen, um, would you, so are you interested at all in running federally? I, I thought you might be. And I said, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it maybe. And he said, well, I have an idea. And I said, oh yeah, what's that? He said, well, I think you should run federal. And he said, but I think you should run for us. I said, for us? who's us <laughs> yeah. you know, for just for justin trudeau he said i think you'd be amazing uh mp and he said and i think you're the only one who could beat scott armstrong who was an mp and had been in already yeah uh, had replaced had replaced him at one point and then he came back and beat him yeah well, you know yeah it was one of those kinds of things and he said i think you're the only one who can beat him because he's going to run again and i he's, i said well i I had to go to Ottawa anyway for something else. And he said, well, when you come to Ottawa, why don't you come and meet the prime minister? And, and then you can, you know, decide for yourself. So I went up to Ottawa and I met with the prime minister and I also met with Jagmeet Singh. And uh, I talked to both of them. Uh, they both were interested in me running. Uh, I really liked them both. And I came back and I, I put it on Facebook. I said, hey, you know, folks, listen, um, I've been asked to run federally by both the NDP and the, the Trudeau liberals. And I, I'm not sure what I want to do or if I should just stay where I am or what, you know, I want to do what's best for my constituents. What would you like me to do? So I got all these responses, of course, and pretty much to a T, everyone was like, go federal, go federal. Yeah, we, 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 yeah, like you'd be fabulous. We want you, you know, you're what we're, what we're after. Um, you've done a great job for 10 years provincially. Yeah, go federal and, and go with the liberals, go with Trudeau. That was like 96% of what people said. And so I um, talked to my family, you know, lifelong NDPers. And I told them what was going on. And my dad thought about it for a while. And he said, you know, Lenore, I think you should take them up on it. I think you should go with, with Trudeau. And I, he said, I think he is uh, an admirable young man. He's a social Democrat, as far as I'm concerned. He said, I see all the things he's doing there, all the things we would do, we would want done, if, you know, that the NDP should do if they were in. And he said, I think you should go for it. So I told uh, Bill and um, I ran for the I ran for the nomination and won the nomination and then won the election. <laughs> and, uh, and when you win the nomination. So when you announce you're running for the nomination for the liberals, is that when you begin to sit as an independent or are you yes. asked to sit as an independent? No, no, I, I decided that you, very day, that okay. very day, the day that I. The day that I announced I was going to be running for the nomination for the Liberal Party, Federal Liberal Party, I sent a letter as well to Gary Burrell and to the, the caucus chair and to the Speaker of the House and said that I was stepping out of the NDP uh, caucus and would be sitting as an independent. Okay, so I asked you provincial... Until... until, until you find out if you won the the nomination and then when once you win the nomination then you have to uh you have to um resign. give up being an MLA. yeah you have to resign you do yeah. oh yeah. i didn't know that i didn't know that in uh, nova scotia politics yeah um so i asked you provincially how you felt on election night when you saw your name get elected 
As a lifelong NDPer who was elected three times as an NDP in Nova Scotia, first off, how interesting is it to see your name in red instead of orange? <laughs> and then secondly, how interesting is it to see your check mark beside your name as the next MP elect for the riding of Cumberland Colchester? It was exciting. <laughs> It was exciting. And I have to say the night of that first election, oh my gosh. I mean, it went back and forth, back and forth all night long between me and the other Scott Armstrong. We didn't find out until 1.30 in the morning that I'd actually won. Oh, wow. We were like the last writing. It went back and forth and back and forth so much like that. It was hard, to, hard to call. Because if, if anyone remembers, in 2015, all of Atlantic Canada went liberal. Like, there was not one conservative. So 2019, there was a chance that there was going to be some flips. And yours is a traditional swing riding. And that yes. probably was nerve-wracking to see it go back and forth so many times. It was. It was. I think my parents were more nerve-wracked than I was. I was pretty calm. But again, that's where, you know, the the performing skills come in. You know, when you when you're used to going on stage and having to perform in front of thousands of people and anything can go wrong, you have to have nerves of steel. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I have like two areas I want to cover. And if you have like 10 minutes, I'd be happy. To, uh, sure. if that's, is that OK? I apologize. for. I said 40 okay. minutes. and I just looked at the time like, oh, <laughs> Um, well, it's very good and fulsome discussion. So. And that's what I like. Um, we talked about, you, you mentioned a little bit beforehand that you didn't really have much time to sit in the House of Commons because of COVID-19. Yeah. But you got to go in and sign the, the, the record, I'm assuming, because mm -hmm. you were elected and you got to sit in the House of Commons. Now, you are one of a few thousand people in this country who've had that awesome responsibility as a reporter in Ottawa for my, my preteen years, I should say, my, my, my formative years as a reporter. I was always in awe when I walked up those stairs into the House of Commons. You actually got to go into the, well, the, the new West Block chambers because there was, yes. a, they changed. Yes. You talked about walking into the Nova Scotia <laughs> legislature. What was it like to walk into the, the biggest hall of power in Canadian politics where great people have come before, like Tommy Douglas, Pierre Trudeau, Wilfrid Laurier, Sir John A. Macdonald. Yet again, we there are p issues with those people, but everyone has issues at the end of the day. <laughs> no, it's an amazing feeling. It really is. And <clears throat> interestingly, when I had met with Trudeau and with Bill Casey that first time the year before, they were in the old building. They were in the original House of Commons. So I did get to actually go into that beautiful, oh. that beautiful building, which is Jealous. so spectacular, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, right. And so then when I actually ran and won, and then I'm going into the new building, it is still, it's stunning as well. And to sign, you know, to swear the oath of allegiance uh, to the queen and, you know, have my mom and dad there with me and mom and dad, they had never been to Ottawa. They're both, they love their history. Mom was a history teacher, they're history buffs and they've been all around the world, but they've never been to Ottawa. And, you know, dad was 89 or 88 at the time. And my mom was 84 or something. So it really meant something to have the three of us there. And we were immigrants, you know, from Australia, these immigrants from Australia who came to Canada with all these, you know, starry eyed dreams and everything. And here's their daughter. You know, it was a very, very emotional time for us. And it, it was an incredible time. And, it be, you know, and the COVID-19 came upon us in like February the 2nd or something. That's when everybody started really talking about it. And so everybody's rushing around and it's like, you're trying to get to know people and you're, there's all these people, hundreds of people. And, you know, you, and you've got issues in your own writing that you want to talk to like the minister of health or this one or that one. I, there was a young woman that had CF and she needed a special type of medicine. And I was trying to get the minister of health to help me figure out with, with that. And, you know, I mean, one thing after another, it was like trying to get everything done as quickly as possible. And then bang, suddenly it's like, bang, okay, poof, 
you all go back home. The day that I was time to go back home was the day I actually got my name tag for the, my, the, the gold brass thing for the door of my office. You know, oh. like I didn't even get the office until the final week. And then I got the little name thing and it was like, but, and then we're gone, Boop, you know, and we never went back. I never went back. It was, you know, so it, it was, I felt in some ways like I, I kind of got the, the, the short you got robbed. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You were an MP in name only, it sounds like. Yeah, although the workload was, yeah. it, you know, like you were here in your home during COVID. And that was February. We got sent home in March. And in April, we had the mass shooting. And so then you're dealing with, I'm, I was dealing with bringing people home from like other countries that were stuck in other countries, trying to get them home on these remediation flights. Um, dealing with all the businesses that are going crazy because they're going to go out of business and how are you going to be able to pay people and how are you going to keep people afloat and how are people going to put food on the table and what about artists and people who are self-employed who have no work now um, and people are freaking out and it's just constantly on you and then you have a mass shooting on top of it I'm telling you I, I, I didn't sleep I probably slept maybe three or four hours a night Wow. And I was on my computer and phone all the rest of the time. And you couldn't go anywhere anyway, because you're lo under lockdown and we were under a state of emergency in Nova Scotia because of the pandemic. Anyway, you couldn't even go see your family, you know? So I was stuck here in my house by myself with my dog for like two years. Well, you know? our dogs had dogs during those two years. So <laughs> yes, oh our house became a dog fest in this house. And it's just one of those. <laughs> oh my God. That's funny. Um, you... Yeah, it was, it was an, it was a nightmare scenario really, but I did the best that I could. And I brought a lot of money to the community and I did a lot of things for, you know, for environmental things and also for community, um, community run nonprofits. And, you know, we got a lot, we got a lot done in those two years. So I, I was very disappointed when I didn't get to finish what I was really getting started. Because I want to talk about that bill. I want to talk yeah, about bill. the, the yeah. bill. Bill Which C two it is, and I saw that, yeah. and that's that's when I reached out. I was like, okay, I need to have her on because I want to see right. where this bill is. So this yeah. is Bill C uh, two thirty. You introduced yeah. this, if I'm not mistaken, in the last year of the uh, sitting, and it was it got the approval from the uh, NDP, the Bloc Quebecois, and if I'm not mistaken, the Green members. Yeah. Um, and the Liberals. And the Liberals, yes. And of course, your caucus. Um, yeah. What, what is about this bill? So talk to talk to the people who, in the Coles Note version, what is Bill C-230? So basically, Bill C-230 was a bill, in short form, you would call it an, a, a national strategy to address environmental racism and environmental justice. And what that is about is that um, there are more communities of people of color who are affected by toxic waste sites, dumps, uh, pollu corporate polluters, what have you, than um, people who are not racialized, than say, the white community. Why is that? Because historically, usually the colonial people, they didn't think people of color were important. They didn't think the indigenous people were important. They didn't think black people were important. All they thought was important were their lovely white, you know, European people that look like us. And so if they're gonna get rid of their, their waste, they would put it as far away as possible from them. And if they put it in the middle of a black community or an indigenous community or whatever, so be it. And that's called environmental racism because what time has showed is that the people living in those communities have worse health outcomes and are affected by that pollution more than people who don't live right beside those polluting um, places. And so, and, and so the bill basically would enshrine in Canadian law the fact that everybody has the right to clean air and clean water in a nutshell, yeah. that's what it is. 
And so, um, which you think would be beneficial because there are a lot of First Nation uh, communities that are still under boil water advisory. I know the Trudeau government yes. is trying to change that, yeah. but we need to we need to expedite that quicker, if, in my opinion. <laughs> yes, absolutely, and they are working on it, and they have done a lot in that aspect. But yes, yeah. we need to have more, and it needs to be enshrined in the rights. And that's why like the David Suzuki Foundation and many of these environmental and social justice and civil liberty organizations across the country got behind the bill because they said, we've been trying to do this. We've been trying to get Canada to do this. So Lenore, good for you. We're going to support you on this. And so it, it went through the house. It got through the environment committee. We made some amendments to it, which everybody agreed to. And then I reported it back to the house on June 22nd, 2021, last year, last summer. We reported it back with the amendments. Everything looks like it's going ahead. And then the election was called. Yeah. What happens when the election is called? Everything that hasn't already passed through and been you know, pressed by the governor general, general falls off the yeah. table. So um, Elizabeth May, Green Party Elizabeth May, and I became friends during this whole time. She seconded my bill last year. I asked her to, because I wanted it to be, a, I didn't want it just to be one party. I wanted this all to be involved. And she seconded it. And then this year she came to me and she said, listen, Lenore, I have a, a really good spot to introduce a private member's bill. What do you think about me in, in, reintroducing your bill? And she said, it would be my bill, but you know, I'll give you the, you know, the credit and whatever, but we'll get the bill passed hopefully this time. I said, absolutely, let's do it. So then I flew up to Ottawa and met with the prime minister. Yeah. I met with the environment minister about a month ago or something like that. And I made sure I got their assurance that they will support the bill. The NDP is supporting the bill. Um, we don't know about the Bloc Québécois at this point. Now they're on the fence again. And we know the Conservatives won't support it. They've already said so. But we, uh, but we can get it passed with the NDP and the Liberals and the Greens. Yeah. So right now the bill is coming back tomorrow for the second hour of second reading in the House. And on June 22nd, which is next week, it will be voted on to then take it to the Environment Committee or maybe even if they can get it to, to be expedited beyond that. But that will be happening on the same day that it was last year when I brought it back. So, but, but this time we know we've got three years because there's not going to be an election. Wow. So we can get that bill passed, which you, it would be really something. I, I can imagine how, like, just hearing you talk about it, you seem so, like, so hopeful that this is going to become a law. Like, all your work that you, like, 10, 12, almost 12 years of work, and yeah. this is what it comes down to, right? Like, this is, yeah. I could imagine, like, you're just so happy that it's back to where it was before the yes. parliament prorogued. And the thing is, you're right. I worked on it. I introduced it first provincially yeah. in 2014. And I brought it back four times. It never passed, but I kept bringing it back because I wanted people talking about it. I thought if we can start to get people to understand what is environmental racism and to talk about it and to understand it, that's the first step, education. And so now here we are from 2014 to 2022, here we are. And now we're, we're still continuing on with the fight. You know, and Ingrid Waldron, Dr. Ingrid Waldron helped me get it all set up. And she's the one who brought me the idea because she had been working on this issue for some time herself. And she uh, she's now at, at um, uh, a university in Ontario. And so we are we are doing everything we can to try and and make sure that we can get it passed. Well, I wish all the best. By the time this airs, it will have or will have gone to second reading. It will hopefully have passed the committee already. Um, right. Lenore, one last question for you. Yeah. You've had an incredible career. You have had a, probably one of the most uh, colorful careers of anyone's uh, political life and uh, uh, acting life and theater life as well. Um, you are now life after politics is always quite hard, but the phone rang the day after, right? So as you said, yeah. um, 
what's what's on the horizon for Lorraine Lorraine Zan? I don't know. I mean, I've always been someone to take things one day at a time. And that's really what I'm doing right now. Like one day at a time, one step at a time. I'm trying to slow down and enjoy life for the moment as opposed to just racing through it. And when you are in government, as you would know, um, you know, you're just constantly at the beck and call of everybody else. You wake up and you're immediately oh, checking your phone. Is there an emergency? Am I needed? You know, you're on constantly high alert. And especially after everything I went through with, you know, with the, the shooting and my niece dying and everything, it, it, it exp expanded on that. And so I'm really trying to just take some time to uh, wake up and smell the coffee and the roses and uh, my mom and dad are down the road. Dad's going to be 90 next week. Wow. Well, happy early birthday to him. <laughs> you know, and then and tomorrow we're going to be um, grieving and celebrating my, my niece Maya's life because she died a year ago tomorrow. So, you know, life is short. We have to enjoy it and we need to reach out and tell each other you know, how much we love each other and how much, how grateful we are for each other as well. Well, <laughs> I didn't think I'd be crying on episode 399 of the show, but here we are. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Lenore, um, this has been an honor and Thank a you. privilege to have you on this show to talk about your career. Mm -hmm. It feels like, I know we've only known, talked for an hour and a bit, but it feels like we're old friends. And I, I know, I, I feel like that too. <laughs> I feel that way too. I'd love to meet you. I, I Hey, I'm going to be out in Nova Scotia potentially in July. So. Oh, really? Yes. Well, they have some leadership races that are going to be oh. ending. So I'm going to try and get out there and cover some leadership races. So I might really? look you up and, because New Brunswick's having them and Nova Scotia's That's having them. We'll do that. And then if you have a button that from any of your political campaigns, I, do. I would love to add it to my very extensive liberal collection. Oh my gosh, you do. I've got a couple of NDP ones too, of course. They go over on the NDP, <laughs> the provincial ones. Um, Lenore, thank you so much for this. This has been an honor and a pleasure of my lifetime. I'm so happy that you were our final guest before our summer break. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, a, it's great to chat with you. And I, I hope I see you in Nova Scotia. You certainly will. Uh, with that, my name is Christopher Brown, the host of the Cross Border Interviews with Christopher Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, get out from behind social media from time to time and go have a conversation with somebody. I know it's hard in today's society, but it does make our democracy and our society a much, much better place. Much, that, much better. Thank Take you. it from me. <laughs> With that, thank you so much for tuning in. Have yourself an excellent day. We'll be back again tomorrow. Talk to you soon.